Think back to the last time you got sick. Maybe it was recently or last year. Maybe you don't remember because you're a lucky little duck and you don't get sick. Or maybe you're piled up sick on the couch or in bed right now. Whichever it is, do you know what you had? Or for those of you currently laid up with the crud, do you know what you have right now? You might say that it was a cold or a stomach bug, but do you know exactly what pathogen made you sick? Maybe you know it was strep throat or influenza, but do you know the exact type or strain? Even if you don't, your immune system probably does, at least in a manner of speaking. Hello and welcome back to the science scene. My name is Shelby Bradford and I'm the Geeky God, immunology PhD candidate and all around science freak. We're exploring the immune system piece by piece, and it's time to buckle in for another immuno adventure. Today, we're taking a closer look at our adaptive immune system. If you want to join the ride, like and subscribe so that you don't miss any immunology lessons. When we talk about our immune system remembering something, we're usually talking about our adaptive immune system. This arm of the immune system is associated with what we call immune memory. But this memory is not like the ones you talk about when reminiscing about bygone days. That type of memory has to do with neurons and synapses up in your cranium and I'm really not sure we even fully understand them, but that's for a different channel. Immune memory is a little bit different and we've got a slightly better picture of what it is and how it forms. However, we're really getting ahead of ourselves because this memory is one feature of our adaptive immune system and we've barely introduced that. So let's rewind and start there. Unlike our ready-to-go responders from the innate immune system, adaptive immune cells don't engage immediately with potential threats. Whereas innate cells recognize general and shared features of pathogens, adaptive immune cells are developed to recognize very specific features, often fragments of a larger molecule. Since this may sound like doing basically the same thing, let's pause for an example. Picture a house. Every person will imagine some structure that has walls, some doors, maybe some windows, and some kind of roof. But does the house have siding or brick? Is there a wraparound porch or just a front stoop? What color is the door? Is there a yard with a pink flamingo decoration in it? These details distinguish houses so that if you were going through a neighborhood of houses, you could not just tell them apart from the shops in the business district, but actually differentiate them so that you can find and remember a particular one. Likewise, many bacteria and other pathogens have common features, like in bacteria a lipid sugar structure called LPS, that's fairly similar across different species. But many bacteria also have structures that are more unique to them or can have variability that our immune system uses to zero in on. Hopefully now we're all a little more comfy with how specific features allow us to distinguish things better and remember them. So let's get to know our adaptive immune cells. You might know that we have two main types of adaptive immune cells. T cells and B cells. We did an overview of their functions previously, but as a quick refresher before we get into more details, T cells we can break into two more distinct groups, those which kill certain cells and those which assist other immune cells, while B cells most famous job is to make antibodies. So what makes these cells adaptive? It has to do with how they are activated. Let's think back to our innate immune cells. They patrolled some part of our body and used something called pattern recognition receptors to identify threats. 
is something bound this PRR, the cells responded immediately with cytokines or other functions. Adaptive immune cells take a different approach. Unlike innate cells, which use their PRRs to sense these molecules on potential problems, every T cell or B cell will only respond to one specific target, which they do through a dedicated T or B cell receptor. How these cells and this unique receptor are created and the details of cellular maturation is a whole separate video. For now, imagine a slots machine where you pull the lever and a random assortment of pictures comes up and decides if you made money or lost it. Our DNA has regions with special segments that in our cells to be T or B cells will also get randomly assorted and chosen so that when it's time to make a protein, each cell gets a different configuration of this receptor. In this way, we have millions to billions of versions of potential T and B cells. But activation is not always as simple as putting antigen and receptor together. There are often additional steps to initially turn the cells on, as with T cells, but these adaptive responses can also be improved upon, unlike the generic and constant responses we saw in our innate immune cells. So how does all of this happen? In a very oversimplified version, the specific target the receptor is able to recognize shows up and latches on to said receptor. We call this target an antigen, and this is often a fragment or only small region of a much larger structure. Antigen plus receptor does eventually lead to activated cell, but we aren't here for the cliff notes, so let's dig a bit deeper. Exactly how this happens in B cells and T cells is a bit different. Since B cells often depend on T cells, let's discuss T cells first. T cells are like toddlers, at least in the sense of being picky and particular, because T cells will not just accept antigen contacting their receptor. These cells will only accept antigen presented to them on a special molecule from some of our innate immune compatriots. We saw one of these molecules, Major Histocompatibility Complex Class 1, in our last video. Not only is MHC Class 1 the ID badge cells use to avoid destruction by NK cells, it's the only way our cytotoxic or cell-killing T cells see antigen to be activated. So a phagocyte, often a dendritic cell, must put the antigen into this MHC class 1 molecule to activate this type of T cell. But again, like small children, what appeases one does not work for the other. So dendritic cells must put antigen on a different molecule to activate the cell helping T cells, or helper T's. And can you guess what it's called? Major histocompatibility complex class 2. Every now and again we have a naming scheme that makes sense. Now how DCs decide which antigen gets loaded into which molecule is much more complicated than we can discuss here. But in general, MHC class 1 antigens come from things that originated inside of our cells, whereas MHC class 2 antigens come from things with origins outside of our cells. That's not perfect, but it'll work for today. And of course, this isn't actually enough to turn on T cells. They also need to engage with secondary stimulating molecules and then often get directions in the form of protein messengers called cytokines before these T cells are ready to step into action. Once they do though, they'll begin dividing so as to create large numbers of themselves to aid in the immune response, and they usually prove themselves to be worth all the trouble. 
Cytotoxic T cells work similarly to NK cells in identifying compromised cells. These T cells will look for MHC class 1 on our cells that's displaying the specific antigen that was used to activate that particular T cell. When this T cell engages with this complex, it triggers the compromised cell to undergo apoptosis. Meanwhile, helper T cells have a bit more variety in their job descriptions and so can be divided into different subgroups. The subgroup that they ultimately end up in depends upon a combination of cytokines from the activating phagocyte as well as how strongly the T cell binds to the antigen being presented to them as well as other receptors that are engaging with the T cell from this phagocyte. All of these will help decide what helper subgroup the T cell joins. Some of these helper T cells are particularly inflammatory and will produce cytokines to encourage inflammation from other cells like macrophages and K cells and neutrophils. These might be either T helper one or TH1 or TH17 type cells. Other helper Ts are directed to be suppressive and so they've been termed T-reg cells for regulatory T cells. And still others will go on to support production and development of antibodies and B cells, such as Th2 cells or those described as T follicular helper or TFH cells. This is not an exhaustive list of all the possible T cell types and functions, but hopefully gives you an idea of some of them and the variety of them. Now that we've covered T cell activation, what about B cells? Thankfully, they're less fussy than T cells. They'll actually see antigen directly thanks to the function of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system works kind of like the body's sewage system to constantly drain extracellular junk and excess fluid through our lymph nodes or satellite immune reservoirs before letting it back into the circulatory system. So antigen and sometimes whole pathogens will get funneled through the lymph into the waiting receptor of a B cell. This engagement might preliminarily activate the B cell and it can start making some antibody. At this point though, all of these antibodies would be of the type called IgM. It's not a lot of antibody though, in the grand scheme of antibodies, and they might not be super great. So if it's possible, B cells will search out specialized dendritic cells and T cells in the lymph node for support. B cells can also present antigen on MHC class two so that they can interact with some of these helper T cells that see the same antigen. These T cells will produce cytokines to encourage B cells to go through extensive rounds of cell division to improve upon their receptor by altering that sequence through random DNA mutation in the legion for its receptor. So it's like playing a lot of round of slots to try to find the best receptor. Each new cell generates a potentially improved candidate to recognize this specific antigen. And each one of these new B cells will check how well it attaches to that original antigen with the help of the dendritic cells that are presenting it for that purpose. These T cell cytokines might also help the B cell mature into more proper antibody producing cells called plasma cells. These will make bucket loads more antibody as well as better types of antibody like those of groups IgG, IgA, and IgE. This improvement only occurs for antigens where the T cell also recognizes the same antigen and T cells only recognize protein antigens. These then are termed T 
T-dependent antigens. Since this full response of maturation and improvement depends upon the T-cell health. For antigens that aren't proteins, everything after producing IgM doesn't happen. So these are termed T-independent antigens. These might be antigens from carbohydrates or lipids. The B cells do still make antibody, IgM, it's just we don't go through all of the improvement steps that we did with the T-dependent antigens. What I've just described are effective responses. The cells are activated, they begin dividing, and they engage with their target antigen or other function. So what about memory? Our immune memory is comprised of these unique antigen-specific T cells and B cells. The cells have encountered their antigen and been activated, but this is where the details become a bit fuzzy. It was originally thought that what becomes our memory cells arose from basically the leftovers of effector cells, cells that were activated and were still around once the immune response wrapped up. Then, more research was done, which now suggests that at least some of this memory population is generated when the cells are first activated, but they are directed to not engage in the response and instead mature directly into memory cells that are held on reserve. Right now, both seem possible, at least in certain settings. Which one is predominant or more relevant in different circumstances is something we're still actively studying. Regardless of this, what we do know is that these cells assist us by being at the ready if we were to encounter this exact antigen again. Because we haven't really talked about the dynamics of these responses, but it takes time to activate and then mature these adaptive immune cells. It can actually take up to an average of two weeks before we really get the peak robust adaptive immune response. Memory cells, however, because they've already been activated, will be able to immediately engage, tracking down cells or producing antibody and creating boatloads more cells, all capable of recognizing the same specific antigen to get the job done as soon as it shows up. With that, we'll wrap up today's exploration of the adaptive immune system. These cells are unique from our innate immune cells because they're able to recognize very specific parts of much larger antigens, and they actually replicate throughout their response, giving us large numbers of very specific cells. These cells also have the ability to fine tune their machinery to improve their ability to recognize these antigens, which they do as they make more of themselves and gives rise to their being termed adaptive. These factors allow them to generate a population of cells that can be saved or put on hold and reactivated later if we were to encounter the same threat, but on a much faster time frame and in the context of fighting pathogens timing is everything it's really amazing and keep in mind this is still just an overview we've got plenty more to say on this topic and more when we return for more immuno adventures and more awesome science